It's a new year, and it's time to make your next move with Squarespace. Make your next move a website. Make it a beautiful website. If you're going to do that, start with Squarespace. You can create a beautiful website or online store with one of Squarespace's award-winning templates. And if you ever get into trouble, Squarespace provides award-winning 24-7 customer support. Plus, Squarespace offers a unique domain experience that's fully transparent and simple to set up. All you do is just visit squarespace.com slash Google and start your free trial. And while you're there, be sure to use our special GWIZ offer code WORKS, W-O-R-K-S, and you will get 10% off your first purchase. So make your next move today with Squarespace. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryant. There's Jerry over there. Uh, and it's 2017. Jerry, our benevolent dictator. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> She's got those epaulets that she wears all the time <laughs> and sunglasses. Uh, I was just commenting. I thought this is a pretty good article here from How Stuff Works. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've heard that before. Who wrote this one? Do you have that on there? No. I always have it on there. And you didn't have it today? It might be a Shana Freeman joint. I think it may be. That sounds familiar. Yeah. Anyway, it's a good one. Yeah. And well, here it is. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was word for word my <laughs> intro that you just stole. Oh, well, my mind reading classes have been paying off. Um, Chuck. Yes. Have you ever lived under a dictatorship? Uh, Not exactly. No. No. no, I haven't either. Yeah. I and mean, I think we should kind of consider ourselves fairly lucky. Sure. Because it turns out that not only were we born in a, a country that most people would argue is not a dictatorship, although you can find plenty of websites that argue that it oh, it, sure. it is, yeah, it has yeah. been for the last several years, possibly even. For the most part, most people would say it's not a dictatorship. So we were lucky to be born in a country that isn't a dictatorship. But not only that, we we're lucky to be born in a time when dictatorships have become fairly um, hard to find, comparatively speaking, because dictatorships were basically the way that people were ruled for thousands of years. Yeah. Up until very recent times, around the time of the Enlightenment, when the idea of individual liberties and the protection of those indi individual liberties um, became kind of widespread. Yeah, and uh, this article kind of starts off. I thought it was um, thought it was interesting that you don't often. Well, first of all, the word dictator is just one like the one who dictates the thing. It's kind of funny when you break down the actual definition. Yeah, you're like, oh, well, yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense then. It's the guy who paces back and forth in front of the <laughs> desk while somebody's <laughs> typing what he's saying. Take dictation. Yeah, uh, but they don't call themselves that very often. Although it has happened. Um, before we get into the history. Um, it's it's we should point out that like Castro and Saddam Hussein, you never hear them mm -hmm. say I'm dictator as a bad rap. You know, I'm the dictator Fidel Castro. Yeah, it's like how propaganda got turned into PR. Yeah, they will call themselves premier or president or chancellor or Fuhrer. Boss of you. <laughs> uh, Kim <laughs> Kim Jong Il holds three titles. I think he's looking for a fourth and fifth. Like as we speak. Well, he's in the ground. His son. Oh, wait. I got this too confused, right? Yeah. Well, he held three titles. Yes, he did. I imagine, well, his son probably holds four then. He probably found that fourth. <laughs> Just made one up. Did you know, though, that there's like a, I, I, you know, the Kim Jong-un is a, the supreme leader of North Korea, but he actually technically shares power with two other officials as well. They have basically a triumvirate going there. That was news to me. Yeah, those guys are called Keep Quiet 1 and Keep Quiet 2. <laughs> yeah. I was just looking up some of his uh, greatest hits recently. Yeah. And um, Kim Jong-un alone has already started to amass several, but uh, one was uh, a North Korean leader, a pretty high-ranking official, was executed with an anti-aircraft machine gun for slouching or falling asleep at a, at a meeting. Holy cow. Right. But you hear stuff Can like that. Can you imagine that. what that would do to a body? Yeah. Oh, my God. But you should you should take that kind of stuff with a grain of salt, especially when it's coming out of North Korea, because we have really virtually 
no idea what's going on day to day over there. Yeah, even yeah. big events like that, even if it is true that that guy was executed with an anti aircraft gun, mm-hmm. whether or not it was for falling asleep during an, an, right. a, a meeting or something like that remains to be seen. Yeah, you're saying take any information with a grain of salt. Yes, yes, it's good advice. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> but um, as Shana, I believe Shana points out that that dictators do have some things in common, and one of the big ones is is almost 100% of the time a dictator doesn't come to power through a, an election. They're usually not freely elected to that position. No, but they have been. They have been. Yeah, pretty prominently, like Hitler. Yeah, well, he wasn't elected, though. Wasn't he named chancellor? Yes, by the elected president, though. Right, but he still wasn't elected. No, I guess that's true. Yeah, okay. Fine. <laughs> well, let's get into history, then. All right. <laughs> so you say di- dictators got a bad it got it, it's gotten a bad rap over the years, right? As far as calling yourself that, I think so. But it it officially originally, and I couldn't I saw a couple references to Greece, but it seems to be Rome, classic Rome. Um classic Rome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it trips coming into the party and everybody's like that's classic Rome. <laughs> he tried to walk through that screen door. It wasn't <laughs> open. So, classical Rome. How about that? It seems to be an invention of classical Rome, right? Um, There was a station called Dictator. There was an office, basically. And in ancient Rome, um, the the leadership was held by two men called consuls. Yeah. And they were equally powerful, from what I understand. Consuls? Council, consul. Okay. Sure. All right. Um, And when something went down and stuff hit the fan... The uh, Romans had a tradition of appointing one of the councils a uh, dictator. Yeah. Which is basically an emergency investment of unparalleled power into this one person. And the whole thinking behind it was when you were faced with a, an emergency, when the state was faced with an emergency, you needed somebody who could basically get stuff done. Yeah, like a single voice. Yeah, didn't have to go to the Senate to ask anything, didn't have to go... Um, Worry about making the wrong move. The dictator couldn't be held um, criminally liable for their decisions. Yeah. Didn't have to worry about not being invited to the other consul's uh, Christmas party the next year. Right. The other consul wanted to be invited to the dictator's Christmas party. <laughs> That's you right. Know? So you, there was an investment of these emergency powers in this one person. And usually I saw one year. This article says it lasted for six months. And then the dictator would be like, well, that was a wild ride. I'm going back to my normal life. The rebellion has been quelled or the siege is over or something like that. Yeah, and interestingly, there were a few rules. Uh, they couldn't be held legally responsible for their actions. Right. Big one. Uh, it says couldn't be in office longer than six months, although I think is, I think they were there to handle the situation as kind of long as that took. Yeah. For the most part. But there were also guys who were like, whoa, whoa, I like the feel of this. Yeah. I'm not giving this up. And they'll say, well, you have to, we say. And then they, they said, well, I'm the dictator. And they said, oh, we hadn't thought this all the way through. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, they could change Roman law uh, and the Constitution. They couldn't use public money uh, unless other than what the Senate said you could use it for. So they supposedly still, and these are the official rules, you know, as we see. Mm-hmm. Um, coming up here, people bent these rules. Uh, and they couldn't leave Italy was the last one. Yeah, which is a good one. And they would have, like, Colombo come in and deliver that last bit. <laughs> they look, just don't leave Italy for a while, okay? That's your Colombo mm-hmm. impression? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he sounded just like Josh Clark. I thought it was spot on. <laughs> uh, so this kind of happened here and there until about 202 B.C., um, and then about 100 years after that, a gentleman named Lucius Cornelius Sulla. I love all these Roman dictators sound like either 70s, like black exploitation movie stars mm-hmm. or Roman gladiators. Sure. Uh, so he was appointed dictator without a term limit and didn't have these restrictions. And so this sort of changed the game from here on out. Yeah. And he actually wanted uh, Caesar dead. So Caesar ran off and joined the army, Julius Caesar, I should say, um, and and just basically laid low until Sulla died. And then Caesar came back, and he was appointed consul and then dictator himself. He succeeded Sulla, right? Yes. And Caesar um, is very well known to be a dictator, but 
he actually, if you look at the stuff he did, he was a a friend to the people. He forgave debts among a, the a benevolent dictator. The pretty much, yeah, among the middle and lower classes. Um, he improved infrastructure. He um, he basically went to bat for the lower classes, which threatened the elite because he it made him immensely popular. Plus, he was a dictator, so he actually uh, created a he staged a coup to to become a dictator, right? To gain power. Yeah, which we'll talk about a little more. And then a coup was plotted against him, and he was assassinated by the ruling elite of the Senate on my birthday. Yeah. Well, a long time before my birthday, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Back in 1971. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, I mean, we've tossed out benevolent dictator a couple of times, kidding around, but that's a real term, and that generally means a dictator who, for the most part, isn't just in it for themselves, and they are trying to make things better for the people. Right, but it depends on your perspective. Well, yeah, exactly. So, like, the ruling elite found him very threatening. Right. They would not have considered him benevolent at all. Right. But, like, say, the average plebeian would have been like, I love Caesar. Yeah. Give me some more of the coins with his face on it. Yeah, I mean, followers of uh, Castro still, after his death, uh, say he was a benevolent dictator. Sure. But, but again, other people say no. It's perspective. Yeah. It's a subjective term, basically. Uh, Napoleon, actually, um, he came to power again, like many dictators, in a state of emergency. And he was actually a benevolent dictator, in a sense, because he he did a lot of great things for a while for the people. Right. He was extremely popular. Yeah. He uh, was undefeated at the time that he rose to power. Um, he was appointed council, and then he said, you know what, let's go a little further than that. I'm going to call myself emperor. And they said, oh, okay, Napoleon, what could possibly go wrong with that? Yeah, well, first he was named consul, then he was like, I think Council for Life has a better ring to it. Right. And then that wasn't enough. Right. So He's like, let's just shorten that. <laughs> uh, like you said, though, he was super popular because he was he was undefeated as a military leader. Uh, he balanced the budget. He reformed government. He wrote the civil law, which a lot of us is, is still around today in France. Yeah. The civil law. Right. Not too bad. He had a lasting impact for sure. He did. But uh, again, again. To call him benevolent, if you remember a parliament who right. was thrown out of one of the windows of parliament <laughs> right. when he took over, you probably wouldn't be like, you're so benevolent. Right. He also controlled, had an iron thumb on the press. <clears throat> uh, he controlled um, every facet of government. He had a, spies working for him. Right. So it's not like and he wasn't just, uh, you know, Bozo the Clown. No. <laughs> Bo Bozo the Clown was super shady. No, uh if you put all that together, though, Chuck, you get the impression of why uh, historians consider Napoleon the first modern dictator. Yeah. He checked basically every box there was. He had it figured out. He drew new boxes and checked those. Right. He said, all dictators to follow, here's your boxes. I just looked down at your notes, and I want to show you something. I think we should take a break. But before then, okay, Chuck? Mm -hmm. I think you should see this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in this article um, on dictators from How Stuff Works, there's a um, a sidebar is what they're called in web print parlance. Yeah, just a little extra bit. And it, the title of the subbar is Darth Dictator. That's all we need to say. <laughs> and it talks about Emperor Palpatine and his rise. And Chuck had his X'd out. Yep. And I independently x mine out as well so we won't be talking about that today everybody no but uh let's do take that break and we'll discuss that in private so you don't get to know about it and we'll be right back chuck postage rates have gone up again uh which means trips to the post office, which already stink, are even worse now. It's going to be so crowded with people shouting and saying, look at these prices. Thanks to Stamps.com, however, you don't have to worry about it. That's right. Just use Stamps.com to automatically calculate and print and print the correct amount of postage for every letter or package you send. They're going to bring all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your fingertips because you can buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail using your own computer and your own printer. Yeah, and Stamps.com makes it easy. They'll send you a digital scale that automatically calculates exact postage, and they'll even help you decide the best class of mail based on your needs. Plus, Stamps.com saves you money. How important is that? Super. 
That's right. They're going to give you postage discounts that you can't get at the post office, including three cents off every first class stamp. Yeah. And right now you can use our offer code STUFF and get a four week trial that includes postage and a digital scale. So don't wait. Go to stamps.com and click on the microphone at the top of the homepage. Type in S T U F F. That's stamps.com. Enter STUFF and sign up today. With stamps.com, you'll never have to go to the post office again. All right, so we're back. Um, we talked about one of the things that dictators had in common is they generally aren't elected in it like a fair election. Um, they are usually ruling uh, autocracies. Um, a lot of times they have what's called the totalitarian regime. Yeah, we should talk about that. That's a big one. That means you like you are in control of ev- all the news and all the media that gets out about everything. Right. So there there's a it, there's a lot of confusion over the difference between authoritarianism and totalitarianism uh a th- and a, a, a totalitarian regime is authoritarian but not all authoritarian regimes are totalitarian yeah. an authoritarian regime is where the government is headed by one single leader yeah okay there's no parliament there's no courts there's no nothing that the that leader doesn't either control or just doesn't exist to counter that leader's decisions right a totalitarian regime is like you were saying. I think you're missing an eye there. They they could it's like <laughs> Deletrius. They control everything, not just the government. They control the social aspects of life in that country. Yeah. They control the economy of that country. They control the media. They control everything. It's totalitarian. <laughs> uh personal freedoms might be vanquished. Might be. Um there might be police secret police there might be spies spying on citizens yeah uh it's not a good way to live no and and as also a citizen. um you will probably be encouraged that as as a citizen to spy on your fellow citizens because authoritarian regimes quickly learn yeah that if you have a large population it's kind of tough and very expensive to keep tabs on everybody so if you have a secret police going around and people are aware that there is a secret police, they're going to behave themselves more. And if you can get your citizens to kind of keep an eye on one another, everybody's going to behave even further. That's a terrible yeah. way to live. Well, and you know what? Like, it sounds like a totalitarian ruler would be, I bet there's a lot of paranoia that goes along with that. Like when you're right. in that kind of position. Oh, if you're the ruler? Yeah. It's not sure. just like, oh, I rule everything. So it's all good. I, like at that point, you don't know who to trust. You're right. You're probably always looking over your shoulder. You know, it's not a, like, why, why bother with all that? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, it, you know, it's going to end badly. Just kick back and light a doobie <laughs> instead. <laughs> why bother with all that? Uh, many times there, there are, they foster what's known as a cult of personality, and this is a big one. Yeah. Um, if you went into and saw Saddam Hussein's Iraq, or you go to North Korea, or in the times of like Lenin and Stalin, mm-hmm. you're going to see a lot of posters and statues of these leaders everywhere. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You like know, you're, it's just you're, ubiquitous. You're taught that the um, the leader is basically the state. Who is this? The leader, <laughs> right? <laughs> and the state is the most important thing. Uh huh. But the state is personified by the leader, and sometimes they'll even go so far as to say, by the way, the leader is descended directly from God. Yeah. So go make a painting of him, kid. Right. And we're going to put it up in the town square. Who was the one who had the statue rotated to face the sun? He was the head of uh, Turkmenistan. He changed his name when he uh, took over in 1991. Uh, his his birth name was uh, Sapermurat Niyazov, but he changed his name to Turkmenbashi. And then he started naming everything in Turkmenistan, Turkmenbashi, including the month of January. <laughs> but he created that statue. Yeah, and he had the sta- golden statue rotated to always face the sun. So, yeah, he was always facing the sun. Yeah. And he said, read that quote, man. That quote is awesome. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, he said, quote, I'm personally against seeing my pictures and statues in the streets, but it's what the people want. <laughs> <laughs> We got that, I think, from an OD list, actually. Yeah, we'll probably pepper in more of those. Okay. Um, But, I mean, I hope this drives home the point that these um, totalitarian dictators, they're narcissists, they're uh, megalomaniacs, 
they are obviously paranoid. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't need to rule with an iron fist. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's just not it's not a good way to run a country. Like I said, it, it always ends badly. I guess they get caught up in the power, and they don't see what history has taught us time and time again. Dude, I I I wish we knew what it was because you can look around, especially in the world today, and see country after country after country sliding down that rabbit hole. Well, it's a mental disorder on their part, I think. Genuinely. But it doesn't just have to be, be. There doesn't just have to be like a single leader. Like even liberal democracies are starting to slide down that that hole, where like they they want all the information possible on everybody, and yeah. it's ultimately to keep control, you know. But is it based on fear, or is it based on paranoia, or is it based on that desire to hang on to power, or what? Witch's brew of all those things is it that creates that? Why do we keep doing it over and over and over again? Yeah, because it always is the it's the it's the death knell for a, a civilization when it's when the leadership starts doing that. It's unsustainable. Yeah, but and we'll talk a little bit about how they end. But um, it always is badly. Like you see, like Saddam Hussein and power, like in these military uniforms, and then you see this. Like sad old man pulled out of a foxhole. <laughs> yeah, he looks like he, he washed up on Gilligan's Island or something like that. <laughs> or Noriega, like wasting away in prison, like yeah. begging to get out in a wheelchair. And I would like to know the story behind that. Cause who Noriega? He, yeah, Panama and the U.S. were pretty good friends. Then all of a sudden, the U.S. invades, and now Manuel Noriega is in prison in Miami and has been for thirty years. Like he's, something he's went down out of that prison. Is he? Oh, yeah, that's right. And then they sick. transferred him to... Uh... Well, outside the Panama Canal, ironically. Oh, really? Yeah, he's in some prison there. He's like in a wheelchair and in, in his early 80s and just, yeah, not doing so hot. But he served his whole sentence, I think, in Miami. And then they transferred him to Panama to fill, to, to carry out another sentence down there. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But something went down that I don't know about. That I'm intensely curious to know. If well, anybody I'm knows sure out there, <laughs> tell me. I'm sure you could find that out pretty easy, right? Apparently not. I was just kidding. I bet it's highly guarded secret. You think? Even after all these years? I don't know. Noriega had motor... He was a motor mouth. <laughs> I'm sure he told everybody who'd listen. Uh, well, we mentioned Hitler earlier. Um, he, like you said, although not elected, was legally installed. He was appointed chancellor by President Paul von Hindenburg. And then once Hindenburg died, Hitler said, you know what, there's this German word, uh, Führer, that means leader. And he went, why don't we just make that my new title, mm -hmm. which is, because we don't really need a president and a chancellor. I can be both dudes. Right. And then eventually I'll just kill myself in a bunker. Yeah. Another, about to say sad end, but just <laughs> not, not that sad. pitiful end, you know? That's a great word for uh, it. Uh, sad indicates that, it, you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't have to overexplain that, do no. I? <laughs> so, but Hitler, he he came to power legitimately. So did Saddam Hussein. Actually, he was the general of the Iraqi army and vice president. Yeah. And then, as the president came, I think he fell ill. Um, Saddam Hussein started to take on more and more power, and finally was just like, I "I'm president forever now." Okay. Yeah. And I think that's the case. Like the, the, the point that this article is making is that there's a number of different ways a dictator can come to power. They can come to power in a power vacuum. They can come to power in a coup, which we'll talk about. They can come to power democratically. But if it's the kind of person who wants to rule unfettered. Yeah. And they, come they know how to basically work the populace sure and the circumstances are right you know like maybe there's fear of of outsiders coming your way mm -hmm. or the economy's bad or something like right. that then you can conceivably consolidate your power and turn whatever situation into a dictatorship yeah i think it's more it's based on the person and the circumstances uh, that the nation is in when that person grabs power than it is on how they actually get into power. Yeah, and whether or not the current leader just happens to like be out of town or something. Yeah, that's another big one too. Like sometimes, coups. yeah, that's a well. Let's go ahead and talk about coups, should we? Okay, sure. So a coup is um, there are different kinds of coup or coup d'état, but um, a coup is different than a revolution in that there is it's generally a smaller affair. It's not some big mass uprising of people. It's a dude 
gets a, a smallish band of his military cohorts together. And like we were talking about, either someone is sick or they're dying or they're just out of the country on business. Right. And they come back and they're like, you're not in charge anymore. Yeah. Sorry to tell you. Yeah. And they're like, man, the discount on this dishwasher was not worth leaving the country <laughs> for over this. Uh, it can be. Coups can be very bloody and violent, but they don't have to be. Um, and in fact, I think a lot of times they're not violent. No, there's a term, a bloodless coup. Yeah. And it's basically... Uh, like a couple of the things that make coups, uh, or is it just coup, like you were saying? There's no S? No, there's an S. Is, is it silent? No, I don't know that. So we're going to go with coups. Okay. <laughs> a couple of the hallmarks of coups that you were saying, like, they're they're not popular uprisings. It's a small elite group that decide to do it, usually the higher-ups in the military. Yeah. And uh, it, it can be bloodless, where it can just be like, you're not in charge any longer, you were out of the country, stay out of the country. We're, we're putting you in exile. Right. They can be bloody, especially if the person who's being deposed has a lot of loyalty in the military as well. Yeah. Then it can turn pretty pretty bad. Yeah, but I get the feeling that a lot of times the coup isn't attempted unless they feel like they have the support to pull it off. Well, I mean, look at Turkey. Or the, they, the people who tried that coup like just a few months back. Yeah, that's true. Um, I don't know what happened to them. I, I think Erdogan said like the people were going to be punished but not necessarily executed, but I don't know if that's true or not. And that's another thing that can make a, a coup bloody yeah. is that it can fail and then the people who are carrying out the coup get executed or it can succeed and sometimes just for good measure, the uh, the people carrying out the coup execute the former president, which was the case uh, in Peru with Pinochet. Oh, no, right. I'm sorry, Chile. Yeah, Chile. Where uh, Pinochet took over uh, because apparently the parliament asked the military to get rid of the old guy, Salvador Allende, and they said, all right, fine, we'll do it, and then they executed Allende. Yeah, and a coup doesn't always mean a dictator comes right in either. Sometimes a coup can just uh, be temporary until they can elect a new national leader. Right. But it's just basically a, just a very small overthrowing of the current government. All right, that's all. <laughs> So you want to take another break? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. All right, we're back. What's a junta? <laughs> Well, it's related to the jicama um, root. <laughs> the jicama? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, that's not true at all. Uh, and I didn't really know this, but you, I've heard a military junta. Wait, you know it's junta. Is it really? Yeah, that's how I was making that joke. Yeah, okay, I wasn't sure. Because I, I called jicama jicama. Right. Yeah. Are well, you sure it's not jicama? You sure it's not junta? Uh, yes. <laughs> it is. It's a military junta. So the junta is a, is almost like a dictatorship by committee. And you find these a lot in Latin America, and it's a, a committee of military leaders who essentially act like a dictator. Right. They're, it's instead of one leader, it's yeah. maybe three, four top-ranking military usually. Um, there's a If you like Fiji brand water, you're supporting a military junta when you buy that. As of 2006, yeah. the military rose up in Fiji and overthrew the government and now military junta runs the show there. Yeah, that's a bad scene over there. Yeah. Thailand apparently had a um, a coup that same year. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. They uh, they they followed the typical coup where the president left the country. If I were president and I were on shaky ground. Yeah, don't go anywhere. Nope. I'd be like, I'm sitting right here. <laughs> You'd not... be Scarface. You'd just be like <laughs> in your office with submachine guns. And, right. Well, probably not the mountain of cocaine. Right. <laughs> Although I could because I'd be a dictator and no one could yeah, say anything. Do anything you want. Um, but th we, there was one other thing that's really important, too. Not only would I not leave the country, I wouldn't even leave the presidential palace. Because yeah. that's like one of the number one things you do in a coup is you secure the presidential palace. Yep. Secure the prisons, secure the infrastructure, secure like the local media. And um, as long as the president's there, for some reason, physically, mm -hmm. it makes it exponentially harder. I, I don't know why. Yeah. But couldn't, if you were the military, couldn't you just go up to the president and be like, you're not president anymore? 
And they could say, yes, I am. Yeah. You say, no, you're not. We have the guns. Get out of the military. You're right, Get though. Get out of the presidential weird. palace. It's, yeah, it's, it's like- It's very passive aggressive to just like change <laughs> change the deadbolts when they leave. It is. <laughs> it really is. Say, sorry, can't get to your bedroom anymore. But Thailand had the same thing, but but their uh, junta was, uh, or the, the coup carried out by the junta was um, apparently popularly supported. Oh, it was? Yeah. It was the president who was like, I vote nay. Everybody else said, yay. <laughs> So sometimes when there's a dictatorship, they actually give the appearance that they might hold elections. Oh, yeah. Um, when, in fact, it's just sort of a farce. That's a big deal, though, actually, because, I mean, it, democracy or liberal democracies are viewed as so legitimate that dictators will hold yeah. like like farcical elections. These pageantry, basically. Yeah, to make it seem like the, the populace is all for them. But the, the elections will be like... Do you want to keep the leader? No one's running against the leader. Right. But do you want to keep the leader? Yes, no. Please write your address down and include a picture <laughs> of your most beloved person in right. your life. Uh, or in the case of Saudi Arabia, uh, King Abdullah bin Abdul Aziz al Saud. That's a mouthful. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, you know what? We're going to have elections uh, for the first time since the 60s here in 2005. Uh, and you can choose your local civic leaders in your local councils, um, but women can't vote. Like, technically they can, but you don't have the ID to vote because you're a woman, so you can't vote. And a man can't register or register you to vote because you're a woman, mm -hmm. and there just aren't enough women uh, poll workers to register you, so you also can't vote. Right. So it's classic voter disenfranchisement. Saying you don't have ID, so you can't vote, so you might as well not be allowed to vote. Right. So since there's a whole an entire gender that's excluded from the vote. It's not a democratic vote. That's a little less farcical than, say, you know, one where it's like... Where you have no opposition. Yeah. Yeah. And I found this article. It was hilarious. It's called um, Dictatorships. It was on, like, KidsNet in Australia. Did right. you see that thing? <laughs> An Australian website. And, like, at the top, there's, like, teddy bears and a sun and rainbow and blue yeah. skies. And then in the text, it says, Dictator. And it's all about dictators. It was just kind of a, a weird juxtaposition. It had misspellings in it, too, which was weird. Yeah, but it, it made some pretty good points. If I were a kid, if I had kids, I would be like, you read this website. They know what they're talking about. Read it every day. Every day. Just read the dictator entry. That's it. But they mention, although, yeah, they got something horribly wrong. They mentioned dictator Charles King of Liberia. I think they mean Charles Taylor. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Uh who um, claimed to have won by such a landslide that apparently it was like 15% larger than the actual total electorate of his entire country. Hmm. But then I've also seen that he's done um, elections that were watched by outside poll watchers. Right. And um, that they, they just, they said that, no, this is a legitimate election. Interesting. Uh, well, we talked a little bit about, them the dictatorship ending badly or sadly mm -hmm. um a lot of times it's just a simple matter of time catching up to somebody um and they get sick and die lenin suffered strokes stalin suffered a stroke uh, castro got really sick uh you know all the power and money and influence in the world is not going to save you in the end my friend no nope. mr o dictator only paranoia will save you and keep you alive uh, it's always just kind of pitiful, though. I don't know. I, I disagree. Oh, really? Yeah, I think it's worth dancing on their graves over. Oh, no, no, no. I don't mean... I mean pitiful for them. It's just... They never... It seems like they always go out with a whimper. Yeah. You know? Some go out with machine gun fire, though. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> it just It doesn't stay the salad days forever. No, it's true. I think the message is that's no way to rule a people. I, I hope we've gotten that across. You know? I don't know how many dictators listen to our podcast, but I hope that if any do, we've really given them some, some pause to think about what they're doing with their lives. Should we read a few of these uh, weird things done by dictators? Sure. And we should say it, it's widely believed that dictatorships are on the decline worldwide. What are there, like 70 of them now? The, uh, the most I saw was 24 right oh. now. Yeah. Uh, and the the reason why is again they think liberal democracy is like 
basically changing the game. But there was a big influx after the the Cold War ended, where right. um a, a, the a lot of no, I'm sorry, the Cold War began. There was a big influx because a lot of the old colonial powers that mm-hmm. had colonies and say like Africa and Asia suddenly said World War II's over. We're getting out of the imperialism game. Good luck. Right. And that those power vacuums allowed a lot of dictatorships to to um, grow. And then the the polarization of the Cold War allowed them to thrive because a dictator could say, hey, I'm a strategically necessary United States. Don't you like me? Don't you want to look the other way on all right. of my human rights atrocities? And then someone else would say the same thing to the USSR, and the superpowers would prop up these dictators throughout the world. When the Cold War ended, that actually led to a huge and almost immediate decline in dictatorships around the world. Yeah. Yeah, so they're they're hopefully going the way of the dinosaur, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll what was see. that uh, last article you sent, the one – it made a really good point about the United States could learn a little bit about these dictatorships and how they work mm-hmm. not to be like that, but to learn that <laughs> you, you can't not for pointers, yeah, not for pointers, but for pointers and maybe not necessarily saying, Hey, we can just go into a country that's been run a certain way for hundreds, if not thousands of years uh-huh. and just say, do it all different now. Yeah. Here, here's, here's a book on liberal democracies, read it and, do it. Yeah, and that we might have a more successful approach to foreign policy if there was a little bit more understanding on how these systems work. Yeah, and that a lot of these uh, these dictatorships are not totalitarian, but uh, autocratic, Yeah, which makes them inherently weaker. But if we threaten them, if we're belligerent to them, we give those people a reason to be afraid and to line up behind their leader. Yeah. So when we actually threaten... Other countries that are that are autocratic, we we're all we're doing is making the leader more powerful. Right. Whereas we, if we treat them like as kind of a a weak a weak leader uh, of a, a weak state that that is run in a way that suggests that the people aren't really behind it because right. they have to be run with an iron fist. Right. Then that that person's probably going to eventually get deposed. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. It was an interesting article. It was in Reason Magazine, I think. Um, it was written by uh, John uh, Basil Utley. And if Whoa. that guy's not British, <laughs> no idea who is. All right, so we promised a few weird things. Um, where did you find this one? Odie. Strange Things Done by Evil Dictators. Uh, Kim Jong-il. Those dude in South Korea named uh, Shin Sang-ok. And he was uh, known as the Orson Welles of South Korea. And he was kidnapped and brought to North Korea to basically, uh, Kim Jong-il was like, you know, we show the world that we are creative artists. Like, start making movies. <laughs> right. We've kidnapped you and brought you here. Make good movies. In fact, remake Godzilla because we just need our own Godzilla. It's basically what the CIA did with Jackson Pollock in the early 50s, but Jackson Pollock wasn't aware that he was being propped up. Because he was drunk. <laughs> yeah. So they did remake Godzilla, uh, sort of. In a, a movie called Paul Gasari, and um, I looked it up, and he basically looks like Godzilla with like Minotaur mm-hmm. horns right. coming out the side. Yeah, not the best. Uh, what else? This Beatles story was kind of nuts. Yeah, the Marcoses. Remember Imelda Marcos and all of her shoes? Yeah, who can forget? Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos. They ruled the Philippines for a while, and apparently they loved the Beatles back in the '60s. And so they invited the Beatles to the Philippines to play a couple shows on their world tour. And when the Beatles got there, the military met them at the airport and said, hey, uh, before you go to your hotel, you're scheduled for a lunch, private lunch with the president and the first lady. Yeah. And the Beatles were like, look, mate, we're really tired. We're going to just go to the hotel and crash because we've got two shows tonight. And uh, that did not go over very well. Yeah, they uh, were acting through their manager, of course, Brian Epstein, and supposedly the story isn't so much that, but he said that they don't, they don't accept these formal like state invitations, really, as a uh, rule. I got gotcha. you. Either way, they didn't go, and uh, Imelda Marcos got on TV and started talking about it. Uh, Brian Epstein tried to apologize on TV, and they blacked him out, <laughs> and people got really upset. The police, basically, their private police escort was removed. Mm. And the Beatles were on their own. Wow. Which was in 1964 when you're in the Beatles. It's not a good place 
especially in the Philippines, right. to find yourself. Yeah, they uh, basically had to escape to the airport and yeah. just run out to the plane and head off. Yeah, and one of their dudes was like beaten really badly, and Brian Epstein was kept from getting on the plane and had to like basically was shaken down to pay them back money wow. from the concert to get on the plane. Man. And then uh, later on, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lennon, give peace a chance, John Lennon said, yeah, if we go back to the Philippines, uh, it's going to be with an H-bomb. <laughs> did he really say that? Yeah. Wow. He said he won't even fly over it. So they did not have a good experience there. Wow. Who's next? Uh, I think that Idi Amin one was kind of interesting. That sounds so Idi Amin. Totally. He, he uh he declared himself president for life. Yeah, P for L. <laughs> and he um he said, "You know what? I'm going to do this in high style. I'm going to get four white men to carry me around in a chair to celebrate being president for life." And yeah. he called it the white man's burden. Yep. And uh, everybody loved it. He was an odd duck. Yeah, if you if you look up white man's burden and I mean and Google images, there's a couple of really great pictures of these. Mhm. Kind of blonde white men in suits carrying around right. this giant U, uh, Ugandan man in right. a chair. Have you ever uh, read the Bukowski book that was the um, it was the basis for Barfly? Yeah, which one was that? Hollywood, I think is what it was called. I read Hollywood. Was that the one? Yeah, he talks about watching a, a documentary about Idi Amin and how he um, Idi Amin didn't have uh, the money for an air force. But he had pilots that really wanted to fly. So, like, in the documentary, they're showing these pilots running down a runway and then jumping and then going back to the <laughs> to the end of the line and, and just doing this over and over again to practice flying, Yeah, even though they didn't have planes. That movie was good, the Forrest Whitaker movie. Yeah, The Last King of Scotland. Yeah, yeah. great movie. Poor James McAvoy. You know, you can stay in Charles Bukowski's house that he grew up in, in an Airbnb now. Oh, really? Yep. Nice been remodeled no he wouldn't like that but no he would hate the whole thing i'm sure <laughs> how about uh Qaddafi? we'll end with him sure so muammar Qaddafi loved women apparently did you know that about him i uh, did not he loved women and he actually surrounded himself with female bodyguards who he very graciously allowed to wear makeup and high heels mm -hmm. while they were protecting him and the in the West, these women were called the Amazonian Guard. This is just off the rails at this point. Yeah. Uh, and what this podcast? No, Qaddafi's oh. the whole <laughs> the Amazonian Guard, the whole thing. Yeah. So, um, the Qaddafi actually had some sort of legitimate thinking behind it. He thought that an assassin would have trouble uh, shooting a woman. Yeah, it stands to reason, I so guess. So he surrounded himself with female bodyguards who were also trained to kill. Yeah. Uh, but they, they weren't like the Fembots. Wore, wore makeup and lipstick. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, actually, can we mention the Hitler thing? Cause sure. Is this true? I don't know. This sound, is why I, I walked past it. It sounds like urban legend, but supposedly Hitler um, came up with a synthetic blow up doll mm -hmm. to um, comfort soldiers, and it was referred to as a synthetic comforter. Yep. Blonde hair, blue eyes, could fit in a backpack. And uh, they only made about 50 of them because the soldiers were like, I'm not carrying that thing around. Right. What are you, crazy? And he went, in fact, I am. You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> waka waka. <laughs> uh, if you want to know more about dictators, you can type that word into uh, the search bar at HowStuffWorks.com. And since I said search bar, it's time for listener mail. Uh, a quick correction beforehand, because this has to do with bottle feeding kittens, but in our uh, feeding babies episodes, which by the way, thanks for all the support on those, it really made us feel good to know we did a pretty good job there, but I erroneously many times said pump and dump as like, you know, pump breast milk and dump it in the bottle to use. Oh no. Yeah, pump you and dump. You were saying that and pick up on it. Well, I, I just, I think I kind of threw that term around as just the general term for breast pumping. That's fine. <laughs> I didn't. But dumping that. is dumping it down the drain for right. one reason or another. Like you maybe uh, have had some alcohol or whatever. Dumping it straight to hell. Yeah. So, yeah, pump and dump. I, it sort of just kind of went wild there. That's okay, Chuck. That's right. I did notice a couple people saying that, but I didn't get what they were saying. Yeah, I was wrong. Huh. Weird. All right. 
So it feels weird. I promised a story about uh, bottle feeding kittens. Which you ever done that? A little baby animal that you got to care for at that young age. Mm-hmm. Pretty darn cute. Sure. Very powerful feeling. It's very stressful. It is stressful. Uh, hey guys, when I was a kid, <laughs> very powerful. <laughs> you're like, like you want this bottle or not? Breakfast. <laughs> I can crush you. When I was a kid, my older sister had a habit of rescuing animals that uh, became family pets. Um, she rescued a pair of ferrets from drug abuse, quote, <laughs> what? quote, drug abuse, end quote, uh, when the ferrets were being abused with drugs or themselves active users. I still don't know. That's a weird thing to say. Yeah. This is a weird email. Uh, the family ended up stuck with those smelly little weasels for years. Uh, what really I wanted to talk about, though, is much more mundane. Uh, one day we rescued a random stray kitten from our gutter. It's a beautiful little thing, fluffy and snowy white, practically newborn too young to lap milk. Uh, she became a family project of sorts. Uh, throughout the day, almost all the family members would take turns cradling the little kitten, feeding her with a dropper. It was pretty special. Uh, I was maybe nine at the time, but gladly took time away from playing Zelda to feed the kitten. Playing Zelda. I forget it. <laughs> Here's the kicker, though. As much as pure love uh, that we pumped into that little kitten, that cat ended up being one of the most purely mean and different cats we ever had. <laughs> Sounds about right. She grew up to be beyond ungrateful. She came and went as she pleased and was prone to swipe at you if, as if you tried to pet her. She hung around for the food, but after a few years, she just disappeared entirely. <laughs> Sounds like the cat was on drug abuse, too. Uh, most of our cats were sweet and true. Maybe the point is there are just some bad seeds out there. That is from Chris. P.S. The ferrets ended up living for years and years. Huh. What? That was a mysterious email in a lot of ways. Uh-huh. <laughs> There's like a... It was like a David Lynch email. Uh-huh. Uh, well, thanks a lot, Chris, with a K, I imagine. No. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Chris. We appreciate that. And uh, if you out there want to get in touch with us like Chris did, you can tweet to us at SYSK Podcast. You can join us on Facebook.com slash Stuff You Should Know. You can send us an email to StuffPodcast at HowStuffWorks.com. As always, join us at our home on the web, StuffYouShouldKnow.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 